morning. Thank you for coming and being on time. Morning. As promised today, we're going to continue and possibly complete our analysis of a series of key passages in this novella entitled Benigna Machiavelli from 1914. Even if I'm not able to finish, complete my analysis, I will stop to leave enough time to talk about the final exam, to give you a sense of uh, how many questions, what kind of questions, what areas will the questions focus on for the final exam. On Friday, we will uh, watch scenes from the BBC original version of House of Cards before we then engage also with the American version. As usual, I want to uh, introduce my analysis of Benigna Machiavelli by reinforcing the ideology, the system of ideas that you find at play in the story to get an understanding, a better understanding of the Machiavellian nature of this narrative, because as I've said now a number of times, the games played by the character as a child, as a teenager, may seem uh, on the surface simple, even silly at times, yet the framework of the narrative is indeed Machiavellian and therefore you have to be able to look past the details, the circumstances of the various tricks played by Benigna of the various games that she engages in. And as I've said before, keep in mind the basic premise that makes this narrative Machiavellian. Because behind Machiavelli is the prince, and in general, most of his writing, including some of his literary writing, the writings that Machiavelli did, he wrote a famous short story, he wrote several plays, and a lot of poetry. There is this view of the world that most people rely on an ideal model of the world and regulate their actions and behaviors based on what the world should be. Something that Machiavelli, as well as Perkins Gilman, regards as utopia. That is to say, you cannot think that the world will ever be perfect, and if you strive for perfection, you will inevitably fail and not accomplish anything, really. The other way of looking at reality is what is defined in Machiavellian terms, an effectual view of the world, which means to see reality as it is, including the shortcomings of human nature, of society in general, and if anything, Machiavelli errs on the side of pessimism, and there are several passages in The Prince where Machiavelli says, humans are a crafty lot, that is one famous definition rendered in uh, English, human nature is such that most people would cheat or be dishonest unless you place boundaries around them, unless you enforce the laws in such a way that you scare your citizens for fear of retaliation into practicing honesty. If the previous view can be defined as utopian, the other view of reality is strictly pragmatic. And again, this is also reflected in Benigna Machiavelli. The 
one of the passages that we will look at talks about life in Benigna Machiavelli as a game. And as far as the game of life is uh, involved in, in the events of the story, there are several areas where you can see the character engaged in this. And of course, you, you see at the beginning in the first chapter that school is a specific context and then right away family and within the family there is a lot of focus on the marriage the context of the marriage between father and mother to the character clearly a lot of abuse both in the family and in the marriage whereas in the school it's mostly the irrelevancy of the activities there that gets the attention of the character by the end of the novella work and profit will be another context in which the game of life is played but regardless of the specific circumstances of the episodes the general framework for this is that both in Machiavelli essentially and in Charlotte Perkins Gilman the idea is that religion and the values preached by religion, morality and the values that are transmitted from generation to generation, social rules in general, which are the strongest rules in most circumstances, in most episodes, that is to say, it's not like the characters, especially in Benigna's family, but also at school, are really aware of the uh, traditional cultures of religion and morality. However, they do a lot of conforming, right? So they follow social rules because everyone does, and they comply even when they don't want to, even if they don't really believe in the foundations of those social rules, they play the game. But both in Machiavelli and in Charlotte Perkins Gilman, the idea is that religion, social rules, morality, they're all external to the game of life. They're not intrinsic. They're not built into the game of life. They try to impose their values, their practices, their rules and most people end up being influenced by the agencies society politics the church most people end up being influenced by those agencies into for the most part playing by the rules however if you look pragmatically objectively at the game of life as the character tries to do from an early stage in her life, you can see that there is nothing intrinsic. There is no intrinsic motivation for the application of those rules. In fact, through the development of the narrative, there is also a, uh, an increasing dose of criticism levied at religion, morality, social rules in general, because not only are they extrinsic to the game of life, but they end up producing more ill than good. Because after all, religion, morality, the social rules do nothing to ensure the harmony inside the family, to protect uh, Benigna's wife, Benigna's mother, from her husband's abuse. Not only that, but it seems that when there is an argument that is not just emotional or physical, but that is developed through reasoning and it'll be about an inheritance on the wife, uh, on the wife's side that the husband, Benigna's father, wants to appropriate, he can easily borrow the reasoning of society, of religion, of morality, 
he can base his thievery, right? His abusive appropriation. He wants this inheritance and we know that he wasted. He wants to take it from uh, his wife. And all the arguments he tries to persuade, he uses to, to try and persuade his wife are in fact the arguments that we find inside morality and references to the social rules, especially, and, and uh, ultimately to religion as well. That is to say, not only are, are, are these laws and moral values extrinsic to the game, but when brought in, their consequences are not good at all. What is that replaces this traditional view of life or the character? in a way that is mostly like a, an example of literature for, for uh, children or, or young teenagers, right? The, 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 the style mimics the style of children's literature, right? Very simple, uh, very reassuring, but ironic, because behind this narrative, there is an attempt to overturn systems of oppression. What is the pattern followed by the character, almost in a childish way, to observe reality around her, and therefore to gather from the context the rules and the strategies of her behavior. Instead of going to religion or morality or social rules to model her behavior. From this analysis of the context, you have an initial rough plan, and also you have the uh, design of a goal, right? I want to do this. I have this desire. I want to modify life according to my plans. Then you have usually a first set of actions that are only partially successful, Actions are followed by reflection. She learns from the first deployment of her strategy. She plans again, and then she acts again. And you can call it a reaction because this new set of practices are based on whatever went wrong when the first actions were deployed, okay? so. Keep this in mind because otherwise some of the examples, as I said, seem silly when in fact they are an ironic deconstruction of the game of life. I've included some key passages in a new page that I created that you find in here under 1C of today's lesson plan. <clears throat> And I have highlighted passages in a series of um, chapters and from several episodes. I've already added some information about this before. I'll try to go through this as quickly as I can. Of course, feel free to interrupt, to add references to other passages that I haven't included or ask questions. So keeping in mind the ideas from my introduction, now you may get a better understanding of the reasons why the intro, the first page of the novella has to do with what the Reverend William Cutter, whom we will find also in the episode of the Globe, is saying in, in church to his faithful. This serves to establish the premise that the church is one of the agencies that emphasizes an idealistic view of reality. Reality as it cannot be, reality as it should be, as it ought to be, but never is. This time, in reference, again, the, the application may seem silly, and it's ironic, to resolutions, to good resolutions, right? 
So the Reverend is called in, his faithful, uh, the members of his community about not keeping up the good resolution. And of course, it's, it's a given that anyone, everyone is a loser at this game. And right away, you find the irony of the character directed at this saying, well, I had no problems with this because I'm simply not playing the game. I made only three resolution two years ago and then two resolution and then one resolution only, which means I don't want to play this. I don't want to play the game that religion or morality or social rules are telling me to play. I want to really change the world. And again, you find this concept reinforced, the concept of the difference, the contrast between the world as it should be and the world as it is in this paragraph with the reference to the utopian the aspiration of most people. They, the people in society, aspire by jerks, meaning in an intermittent way, to all sorts of perfection. Make a jump for it, miss it, and then complain of the futility of human effort. Just look at the personal revelation books. Those people who wail to us from Paris, Petersburg, and Bate Montana. Now I should have added a footnote. Why include this reference to this uh, forgotten town in Montana? It was famous in the early 1900s because gold was discovered in 1900. In this town, of course, everyone uh, came to look for uh, gold and, and become rich, right? So, always passing and lamenting and blaming providence or fate or something. So, again, looking at the external factors which cannot really have any kind of positive impact on the game of life. that why don't they do things? And this is similar to the very pragmatic approach that we find in Machiavelli. And we will find evidence of Machiavelli's pragmatism when we get to the final chapters of The Prince, where Machiavelli, in the end, after spending so many chapters describing his complex system, says, However, forget everything, even if you make mistakes, the best thing is to wait. Even if you don't do it right, don't wait, don't pause, don't spend too much time contemplating solutions, act. And he does that because he, he, he sees himself in the, and, and Florence and Italy in the middle of a powerful crisis and uh, time cannot be wasted. I learned a lot when I was a child from novels and stories is another ironic statement because look at how this plays out. What did she learn? Villains always went to work with their brains and accomplished something. Why? Because villains disregard social rules, morality, religion, and play. So apparently they do play the game of life based on whatever is in the context, right? And also, they don't have, they're not hesitant, right? Uh, they, they, they're not uh, inhibited by any concern about complying with social rules, about what morality tells you not to do, what religion tells you not to do. To be sure, they were foiled in the end course, in any kind of literature, especially literature for children or teenagers, during the time there was a strong moralistic component and the evil character has to be punished in some way or another. But that was by some special interposition of providence, meaning, again, they didn't lose because their game was wrong, but because of external circumstances they were unlucky. 
not by any equal exertion of intellect on the part of the good people. So in this context, the game of life, you just look at the skills of the competitors, of those engaged in the game. And she will do that with her family, essentially. And her chief game through the novella will be to defeat her father, to neutralize her father's attempt to ruin the relationships within uh, his family and, of course, be abusive to her wife. Uh, she will be able, by the end, to produce a result in there, the kind of result that is acceptable, right? She, there is a limit, she admits that there is a limit to what she can do. The heroes and heroines and middle ones were mostly very stupid. Why are they stupid? Because they play by the rules of morality and the social rules and religion and they're seen as passive in the next statement exactly because they accept those rules instead of taking the initiative the way that Benigna does. And again, there are rules that Benigna herself, as a child or as a teenager, cannot change, but she does as much as possible. She doesn't impose any rules on herself. There are no self-imposed limitations. There are objective limitations around her, right? For example, she knows that she cannot force her mother to just leave the house, right? But she can do other things to achieve her goals. If bad things happen, they practice patience, endurance, resignation, and similar virtues. All the virtues that are uh, placed to the attention of the readers in that kind of literature go out of the context in the, direction, in the direction of the external agencies that try to force their way of behaving and their ways of thinking uh, to the players, humans. If good things happen, they practice modesty and magnanimity and virtues like that, but it never seemed to occur to any of them to make things move their way. And of course, this idea that you can set a goal for yourself and then pursue it no matter what to the extent that you can to achieve that goal is very much Machiavellian, right? Even though we are aware of the fact that the system that Machiavelli exposed in The Prince is political, not strictly individualistic. And Machiavelli save for one short reference to wealth and success, didn't think that his system should be applied outside of the world of politics, okay? It should be the play, the kind of game that each individual in society uh, tries to, to play, okay? We have the episode of the cookies, right, when Benigna and her sister Peggy are caught by their mother and they're both punished, Benigna for taking the cookies without confessing and her sister for confessing but denouncing Benigna herself, right? So both are found in violation of basic rules of morality, the way Benigna approaches this through observation, analysis, action and reaction is to try simply to manipulate the system as best she can. So as a child she sees that confessing to something she committed can result in a reward from her mother, so she tries this course of action. Is it confession? If I tell you, she says, her, she, she tells her mother, I, oh mama, I broke a kitty yesterday. 
tapped on it and broke it. I cried, eager to partake of the new virtue. Meaning, I, I confess, I'll have a reward. Again, it, she's trying a set of social experiments that are kind of silly, but what's important is that she looks at the world with fresh eyes. She's not influenced by external agencies. But mother was suspicious, as we hadn't any kitty at the time, and explained to me the evil nature of lying, as well as the values of confession and repentance. Then I made a plan. So the plan changes, and the new plan is to eat the cookies again with her sister, get rid of any sticky evidence, the, the crumbs from the cookies, confess, because that is part of the game she has learned, not report, not snitch on her sister, because that is not acceptable within the game, and then reap the benefits. Be praised by your mother for confessing, not be reprimanded by your mother for snitching on his sister, and his sister, her sister, uh, is punished in, instead for eating the cookies and not confessing. Okay? Again, don't look at the silliness of the episode. Look at the implied principles. Then there is the episode of the quarrels between mother and father. She wants to stop the abusive behavior of her father. She uh, uh, tries by uh, a first time by accidentally hurting herself to stop uh, while she's thinking about ways to uh, make them stop. She hurts herself. Uh, they, they come, uh, the parents come to, to, to her aid uh, and, and they stop quarreling. So from this first course of action for a first set of observation, she plans and acts again. And this time the diversion is simply tipping over a small work table, but she gets a spanking. And um, this doesn't really work, so she analyzes the situation again. And she understands that she was able to stop the quarrel the first time because her parents believed she was hurt. So she falls down the stairs. This works, but only works once because from that point on, her parents uh, send their kids away whenever they want to argue so that, that her fathers can be as verbally and also physically abusive as he wants. I included the passage about Machiavelli. There is this kind of, again, uh, funny bit about uh, Benigna's grandpa, Machiavelli, married to an Italian woman, and either they're related to the Machiavellis through this Italian woman, or in fact, according to her grandpa, Machiavelli is related to a Scottish family, and they're the true Machiavelli, but this is the important part, the manifesto, right? The declaration of intents. I'm a Machiavelli and proud of it. That is to say, I reject whatever morality, social rules, and religion is trying to teach me in ways to behave, and I just pursue my goals to the extent of my ability. The Scotch name I have to wear outside, like a sort of raincoat, but my real name I always feel is Machiavelli, Benigna Machiavelli. I mean, never uh, to marry and change it. And of course, keep in mind the abusive marriage that you find in here. And Benigna was from the name of uh, her grandmother, who was a Quaker, so Benigna Machiavelli is in itself a paradoxical label 
where you find benigna in reference to all of this, right? Morality, religion, social rules, because benigna means someone who has a benevolent disposition, right? And Machiavelli, which inspires instead a more pragmatic view of society and of life. And once again, multiple references to the abusive behavior of her father, but the reaction is never simply to condemn that abusive behavior in a moralistic way. It's to try and find a solution, a pragmatic solution. If you have an active mind, a real active mind that likes to work, there is profitable experience in most everything, even pain, even abuse, meaning you learn how to plan better to achieve the goal that you have in mind, and the ultimate goal for her is to neutralize, if she cannot remove her father from their family, she can at least neutralize his behavior. And she will be largely successful at this by the end of the, of the novella. Look at the kind of experimental attitude that reflects the character's pragmatism. For example, she's in school and she says, suppose we talked out loud, I thought, what would happen? Suppose I did, I'm going to, just to see, she says, it. And of course, the teacher says, who said that? Right? Because one of the norms for traditional schools, even in my times, was you, you, you don't talk in class. You don't talk at all. Absolute silence. I had a kind of traditional teacher. I tried something like that in third grade. Only I whistled. Because really, I, I cannot stand authority of any kind. And so I said, Let, let's see what happens. And I was sent behind the blackboard for, for whistling, briefly whistling in class. Never try it again. I did that. OK, good. Good for you. And I loved whistling when I was a kid. And I found out nothing happened, meaning there are no major consequences. What is the force? How is morality, the social rules, and religion really enforced on the individual? Not much. Nothing happened. She gave me a mild reprimand, told me not to do it again, which was needless. I wasn't going to. I'd find out what I wanted to know. Meaning, it was a social experiment. It was a test of the limits of the teacher's authority. And of course, in terms of authority, her father's authority is the one that is most extensive, right? Up to verbal abuse and physical abuse. However, even in that case, Benigna cannot be changed, cannot be forced to change her attitudes, and ultimately, therefore, she will show herself stronger than her parents and her father in particular. Even in the case of the episode of the teacher's watch, right? So they have a nice teacher, a teacher that Benigna loves. And um, a, a, a rough kid from the class breaks that watch, steps on it, makes it fall, and then steps on it. And the teacher uh, plays nice, doesn't blame the kid for this, simply says, I'll buy another one. The next day she comes in and she has a tin watch while the other was a Lugin watch, a Swiss watch. So an expensive one. And Benigna says, I'll replace it. And uh, she, she thinks she plans a secret society. She thinks of a show uh, and uh, she will charge uh, tickets for this uh, show. So the other kids essentially, uh, by paying a few pennies each for the tickets uh, to see this show played in uh, the back of her house, will give her enough money to purchase a watch. The watch will be returned. A new watch will be given to the teacher. And Benigna doesn't want to have any reward there. Her reward is she achieved the goal. There is no point in her to be recognized as the one who masterminded this. Okay. 
you understand the implication. However, I want to direct your attention on this passage. Because in a subtle way, in an ironic way, you uh, get to understand that one of the motivations for Benigna was not simply to be nice to someone, this teacher, the substitute teacher, who was nice to Benigna, but also to do something that her parents, particularly her father, would never have done. Because they would never get money and then spend that money for someone else. So even this has to be seen as an act of rebellion, as evidence of Benigna's strength within her family, that she's stronger, that she's not playing by the rules that her family is trying to impose on her. Because mother, of course, would, play, would go along with his father's uh, attachment to money, and her father would be very critical, and, and in fact, he has a critical remark at some point. Okay. The episode of the globe is also kind of silly. She wants to play with this globe and uh, the, the reverend Mr. Cutter has one. He allows her to play with it and she comes up with a manipulative scheme <coughs> that makes reference to a short story of the camel who uh, wants to get warm and asks permission to stick his head into the tent and then a little more, a little more and of course the entire camel's body ends up in the tent. And this, uh, in reference to Benigna, her strategy is to first get permission to study using the globe in Mr. Cutter's rooms and then she gets permission to invite a student and then another one and of course because uh, Mr. Cutter doesn't want to be bothered by so many kids at the end he says okay I'll give the globe to the school so you can use it okay but the relevance of this is in showing this process of observing getting a goal in mind, planning for it, acting, seeing the results of the first actions, planning again, learning from the first deployment of the strategy, and adapting the course of action uh, to the full achievement of the goal. And in this case, is the language that counts. The idea that father is like the head of state for the family. And there are a series of passages where the narrative borrows the language of politics and international politics simply to show that Benigna approaches the game of life as if, as if it were a Machiavellian game, right? So she's not treating her father like a relative, like someone she's bonded with or emotionally attached with. She observes her family situation in a very neutral way. She's not swayed, she's not influenced by the fact that she, she is uh, his daughter. Uh, of course, that is something she cannot change, but she deals with her father as if he were a neutral competitor. What are his strengths? What are his weaknesses? How can he be manipulated and eventually neutralized? his power uh, be neutralized, right? And you, you can observe this. And the ultimate goal, well, horrid father, abusive to his mother, how to mitigate him. I couldn't stop it, right? She cannot physically remove him, although She'll manage to, because eventually she'll send father away to Scotland with a trick, and by the time he returns, his mother is psychologically stronger 
because she knows now that she can live without him, that she can be economically independent. So Benigna manages to change the equilibrium in the game played by her family and within that marriage, given her mother more control over finances, which are a basic element for a family like theirs, and, and therefore his father is, is not as powerful as he used to be by the end of the story. And when you read, now suppose he was a giant or an ogre and had us. What could I do to uh, outwit him? Or suppose he was an enemy and had us in prison or enslaved. What could I do for mother and Peggy? Again, it's a very neutral view of the situation. Instead of saying, is my father, I have obligations, I'm bonded with him, uh, etc., etc. Right? So that is the true Machiavellian nature of this. Not, not the simple tricks, the simple manipulations, uh, the, the duplicity of the character. Opposition was out of the question. She can oppose her father straight on, or conquest, it cannot force him, or escape, leaving the family with her mother. Wives and children can't escape, it appears, right? Society would not allow it, and this is an indirect criticism. All these external syst systems trying to impose their value, they manage to reinforce abuse, right, and oppression. I tried to think that out, gave it up, but eventually she finds a way and when she says I had to realize very young that I was queer, she wants to say I'm not like anyone else, meaning I don't play the same kind of game. I don't believe that there is a perfect world because this perfect world tells uh, uh, members of a family that the father is the head of the house and should be respected and obeyed even when this father is abusive, right? And she's different because she looks at life in a different way that fits her own true identity. And here is a reference that I uh, referred to before about the game of life. The best game of all was a big one, living. As I grew, I began to see more and more of it. What fun it was, how wide and endless. Wide and endless because she hasn't imposed any limitations to herself. And what poor players most people were because they play by extrinsic rules. They had no plans at all, right? She always observes and plans and acts and plans again and no idea of rules Beyond second hand low, third hand high, fourth hand, take it if you can, which are rules of bridge. Meaning, they don't understand what the true rules are, but what are the rules for Benigna? Is whatever is applicable in the game itself, whatever is intrinsic to the game itself. So essentially, she makes the rules. Whereas the others try to play by external rules that are completely irrelevant, like trying to apply bridge to the game of life. And when she says, I want to be big, 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 is another way of saying, I make the rules. I'm in charge of my life, right? And she doesn't want to be, she doesn't do it for the recognition. She does it to achieve an outcome. She doesn't want to be recognized as a winner. And this is the last passage Father must go, her ultimate plan, uh, and the motivation for this, right? The abuse. There were the two of them, father and mother, one, her mother, dying by inches before my eyes. Dying physically and psychologically. The other killing her by inches and nobody doing anything, right? Because who's, who cares? in society about this. So I drew a long breath and set my teeth hard. Father must go, I said it over, till I felt like Cato about Carthage. Cato was a famous Roman politician 
who was responsible for the third and final war between Rome and the city of Carthage in modern day Tunisia, a war that was largely useless uh, at that point by the third uh, war, Carthaginian war, uh, uh, Carthage was not the arch rival it was, uh, had been 150 years earlier, the city was destroyed uh, anyway because Cato insisted in the Roman Senate Delenda Carthago est. Carthage has to be destroyed, right? Her, her, her father must go and she'll find a way. She'll send him out to Scotland. She'll set up her mother for financial success. Her mother will uh, make money by giving room and board to uh, people uh, uh, because they have a large enough house. And that was a common uh, activity at that time, a lot of people had to live in a room, could not afford the rent for an entire house. So if you had a house, uh, if you know, knew how to cook, you could make money that way. By the time father comes back, he uh, is, is weaker because his expedition was, of course, a failure. Her mother is stronger and there was, there's been a shift within the context of the family, more power, to her mother less for her father who will end up sleeping in a separate room at the end of the novel. That was uh, all I wanted to say about this and for some reason my iPad didn't recharge during the night probably the charger was not plugged in properly but I still have enough to record this last part. The final exam as you find in the syllabus, the syllabus said between four and six questions. I'm going to provide for this semester five questions in the final exam, essay questions, and you have to respond to four of them, any four of your choice. The areas to focus on, the questions will be based on the following. One of the questions will be based on our Friday lectures, the analysis of films or TV series. Okay, so one of the questions will focus on a Machiavellian character in one or more of the films or TV series at the end of the semester. For the other four questions, two of the questions will be based on the prince, on Machiavelli's The Prince in our analysis of select passages. Two of the questions will be based on Machiavellian texts, such as Stanley Bing, uh, Harry Rubin's Princessa, Benigna Machiavelli, etc. As I said, so it's two on the prince, two on Machiavellian texts, one on films, but you have to answer four of them. You choose which four. For the prince and the Machiavellian text, the questions will come with a handout where I will include passages from the Prince and from Machiavellian text, because I want to provide material for your analysis. It doesn't mean that your response should be limited to the analysis of the passages that I will include, but I want you to have something in front, both to refresh your memory. I don't want you to memorize the Prince or to have to memorize the Machiavellian text we read from, but I want to see your ability to include specific references in your analysis, okay? So let's say that a question is based on Stanley Bing's what would Machiavelli do, the ends justify the meanness, and I include the passage where he talks about the example of Bob and Mary, the abusive boss who exploits her secretary who was supposed to go on a vacation and he's assigned a heavy load of a project during the weekend while her boss is going play out playing golf. This way you can talk about that text because you've read more, but you can include specific references and specific analysis. This is uh, applicable even more to passages from the Prince. If the question is about Cesare Borgia, then I would include chapter seven from the Prince in your handout so that you can both 
talking general terms about the chapter and the ideas of the chapter from your notes, from the analysis, the introduction to the reading that I did, but also include references to specific passages from chapter seven that you can review during the exam and consider that you have two and a half hours for these four essay questions, which gives you, I believe, enough time both to prepare, to read the handout, and to write your question. Your question, your, your answer. Your answer should be at least 300 words. Of course, it's not a game of words. You can write 300 words and say very little, right? But uh, it, it should be a long enough and, and rich enough response. Edmund, you had a question. Yeah, so, so we can't bring in like a copy of the right? No, because I, I wouldn't be able to, to check if you have notes in there, etc., etc. right? So it is simpler this way. The handout will include just whatever is relevant for the question, right? Which could be a single chapter. It could be shorter segments from a series of chapters focusing on the same idea. But in general, the questions will be thematic, not specific, right? It won't be, tell me what Cesare Borgia did to uh, defeat and get in control of his mercenary forces led by the Vitelli and the Orsini. No, it would be, in what ways is Cesare Borgia the perfect model for a prince? And why is Machiavelli first introducing him as the ideal model and then blaming him for his own demise, right? So would be something that is fairly open, meaning that there is no single way to respond to this. And what I want to see your, is your ability to argue, right? Not your ability to provide a comprehensive response, but your ability to argue based not just on generic statements, but also with the inclusion of specific references and even quotes if you want to. I wouldn't advise copying uh, large swaths of the text, but there are certain keywords that you may want to include or simple phrases that will support your analysis. Yes, Nigel. You said um, one question from the film analysis, two questions from the prince, one from Machiavelli and Texan, what was the last one? No, it's one for the films, two for Machiavellian texts, two for the prince, right? These are the five questions and you answer any four. So you could answer the two questions on the prince, one on Machiavellian text, one on the film. It's up to you, any combination of four would do. But clearly having four out of five, you will have to include at least two of those elements. Same for the films, of course, I cannot bring to class scenes, etc., but I will formulate the question in a generic enough way whereby you can discuss the uh, general ideas, the profile of the Machiavellian character for a particular movie, and as much as you can try to bring in references to specific questions. The films are available, some of them require uh, a, a rental fee if you want to watch those films again in preparation for the exam. At the same time though, practically all of the films have some readings attached to them. So if you don't want to watch the films again, you, you can at least review the readings to prepare for that, okay? And it's up to you, right? You play to your strengths. If films and film analysis is not your strongest point, prepare for the other two sections, right? But remember in that case that you have no choice. In that case, you know that you'll have to answer both questions on the prints, both questions on Machiavellian texts. Okay, what else? We still have a minute? No, we are past the time. Yeah. Can we get extra points if we answer all five? I'm sorry? Can we get extra points if we answer all five? <laughs> I haven't thought about this. I'll, I'll think about it and, and let you know. To use the, the fifth as a bonus, uh, it's a valid suggestion. I'll take that into consideration. <laughs>